And Your Honor, I would like to respond for the completeness of the record to what Mr. Boutros said. We in our papers advised that our witnesses had these significant concerns about the televising and we only had a, a temporary stay when trial commenced. Mr. Boutros and the plaintiffs exasperated about our concerns when they asked that the recording continue on Monday morning. So I think the record is quite clear as to the chain of events. <clears throat> well, wait a minute. Before you start that, let me ask a couple of questions. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> if you want to follow up, Mr. Thompson, you can. Dr. Lamb, you said, if I understood your testimony correctly, that there's not a basis that the absence of a genetic relationship increases the likelihood of adverse outcomes for children. That is, the absence of a genetic relationship between the child and the parent. Was that your testimony? Uh, that was, yes. All right. Well, purely from a layman's question, why then is it common for, or at least said to be common, that adopted children often seek out their biological parents? Well, I think that that's because many of them, of course, know that they're adopted and feel that there are, well, there is something important to know about their origins um, that might be revealed by finding their biological parents. Um, that wouldn't be viewed as an index of, of maladjustment. Um, but would be viewed as something that reflected an individual's, um, you know, trying to understand literally where they came from in the same way that, for example, uh, many people are interested in genealogy um, and want to know a little bit more about their, uh, their, their, their family histories. But that phenomenon, you say, would not have any relationship to any social behavior on the part of those children. Is that correct? Um, that's what the data suggests, yes. And you also testified, if I understood your testimony correctly, to say that there's no reason to protect children from lesbians and gays. Well, you've all read about the reports of the widespread priestly abuse in the Roman Catholic Church and the litigation that spawned by those reports. How do you square your statement with that phenomenon? Um, well, the data with respect to sexual abuse uh, and I assume that's what you mean. Your, your, your focus here is on that protection there. It shows that the individuals who have the same, have a same sex orientation are no more likely to abuse other children. Um, that, that doesn't mean that they don't sometimes abuse other children, um, sorry, uh, abuse children, just as heterosexuals do abuse children. And I'm not familiar with all the details of the abuses conducted within religious orders. I do know, for example, that many of the cases in Ireland um, that have recently been disclosed in a, a huge multi-volume report involve uh, heterosexual abuse by religious individuals. And I assume, again, that I, I'm, I'm assuming because I don't know all of the details here, that the abuse um, that you are, you're talking about involves both heterosexual and homosexual abuse. And I don't want to convey the fact that uh, homosexual uh, people never abuse children, um, simply that there are no more, they, 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 they are, they're no more likely to abuse children than are heterosexual individuals. Have you studied that subject? Um, I have studied it in terms of trying to know what is in the literature. Um, my own work on child abuse is mostly about the effects of abuse and uh, the interviewing of victims. So you focused on the children more than the individuals who were thought to be the abusers, is that correct? In terms of my own research on child abuse, yes. All right, very well. You may continue, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to follow up one of those lines of questions. <clears throat> Dr. Lamb, why is it, if the genetic connection is absolutely irrelevant for childhood outcomes, that so many couples pay the money, the considerable expense to go through in vitro fertilization rather than adopt one of the many children that needs to be adopted? Well, certainly it can be important to individuals. Um, the fact that somebody would seek to engage in IVF using their own sperm and eggs would be an indication that it's important to them. 
Again, the systematic research that we have on the adjustment of children shows that children raised, um, conceived using IVF technologies, are just as likely to be well adjusted as those conceived through uh, natural conception, as those conceived with egg donation, as those conceived with donor insemination. So the data are what they are. Well, now let's return to the subjects we were discussing before lunch. Let me ask you, is it true that despite the diversity of gay fatherhood, research to date has, with some exceptions, been conducted with relatively homogenous groups of participants? The research on gay fathers? Yes, sir. I, I think the research on gay fathers, which is certainly less extensive than, uh, than that on lesbian mothers, has, you know, do, does include the population study that I mentioned to you earlier. It does include recent studies of uh, adoption by gays. So I'm not sure about the term um, homogenous in this, case, in this context. Well, let's look at your fourth edition of the role of the father in child development. This is 2004. It's behind tab 40 in your binder. And I'd like to, to will direct your attention to page 402. And this is a chapter written by Charlotte Patterson called <laughs> Gay Fathers. And you have a, a high regard for Charlotte Patterson, correct? Yes. Turning to page 402, the last full paragraph, it starts by saying, despite the diversity of gay fatherhood, <clears throat> research to date has, with some exceptions, been conducted with relatively homogenous groups of participants. When Professor Patterson wrote that, that was an accurate statement, correct? I believe so, yes. She continues, samples of gay fathers have been mainly Caucasian, well-educated, affluent, and living in major urban centers. And that's an accurate statement too, correct? Uh, that was, I believe, an accurate statement at the time, yes. Although the available evidence suggests that self-identified gay men are much more likely to live in large cities than elsewhere, the representatives of the samples of gay fathers studied to date cannot be established. That's an, an accurate statement, true, correct? Uh, that was true then, yes. Most research has been cross-sectional in nature and has involved information provided through interviews and questionnaires by gay fathers themselves, correct? Yes. And her conclusion, caution in the interpretation of findings from research in this new area of work is thus required. And when you edited this book, you agreed with that statement, correct? Uh, it was an accurate statement in 1996, yes. No, it, uh, this was 2004. Uh, okay, 2002. So this was a, a new area of research when you edited this book. That's correct. Okay, all right. Now let's, let's turn to some of those specifics of these studies. In fact, the literature on gay males and their parenting skills is so sparse that you are starting a study of your own in the U United Kingdom, correct? Well, I am studying, uh, starting a study of my own in the UK. Uh, that part is correct, yes. And you're hoping to do a similar study in the United States, correct? Correct. And in your study, you're going to try to match the nature of the parents' prior relationships, correct? Uh, well, you want to match as many issues as you can in order to refine the uh, value of um, informativeness of your study. That's correct. So. One of the factors you're going to focus on is the nature of the parents' prior relationships, correct? That's right. But many of the studies you've relied on in your expert report, in this case, don't attempt to match the prior relationships of parents, correct? Well, some do and some don't. That's correct. We know that economic resources are an important factor in the psychological well-adjustment <clears throat> of children, correct? Uh, yes, I testified, correct. And you would agree that if you had two households, and in the first household, it had a combined income of $100,000, but only one child. And you had a second household that had a combined income of $100,000, but had 10 children. That the resources available to those children would be quite different, correct? Uh, that's correct. And in your study that you are doing in Great Britain, you are going to try to hold to, to control for that in your study, correct? That's correct. And in your study that you were doing in Great Britain, you are going to try to hold to, to control for that in your study, correct? That's correct. But many of the studies you rely on for your opinions, in this case, don't control for that factor, correct? I think that's not correct. Some of them don't. Isn't that correct? Some of them may not. Some of them don't even compare the parenting outcomes to any control group. Isn't that right? 
not the status that I would rely on to be informing an understanding of the comparative differences. The studies that are listed in your materials considered, some of them don't even have any control group whatsoever. Is that right? Uh, that's right, yes. All right. Now, many of those studies, you would agree that taking into account age gives you another proxy index of the degree to which an individual is ready to function as a parent, correct? Age of a parent can make a, a difference to parenting, yes. But many of the studies you rely on don't hold constant for age, correct? Uh, I, I'm not sure that's true, but maybe there are some that do. And some don't, though. You are just not sure of the state of the literature, whether they... Well, I'm, I, I'm trying to really understand your question, because uh, there is quite a large literature on the effects of parental age, and it identifies certain groups as, uh, as problematic. Um, and there is a fairly large proportion of the lifespan where you don't see uh, differences associated with age. Um, so what would be important in a situation is not to be mixing teen parents with mature parents, and likewise not to focus on some of the difficulties that may occur when older people have children. So. This is not something which is just linearly related to the ability to parent. In your study in Great Britain, you're going to be asking whether the parents are sexually inclusive, correct? I told you that we might do that, yes. Again, as I told you, we are about to begin the study. And that becomes especially important because it's one of the issues that is sometimes raised in <clears throat> discussing children's adjustment, correct? Well, the nature of the relationship between the parents is certainly one of the important issues, yes. And to the extent that sexual exclusivity was important to those parents and affected the quality of, uh, of therefore, relationship, then that would be an important issue. And that's what you were going to try to hold constant for it in the study you were conducting, correct? Uh, as I just said, um, I'm not sure that we will, but I think when we uh, discussed this at the deposition, I said that it seemed like a reasonable issue to consider. But many of the studies you rely on have not held constant for the prior relationships of the parent who are studied, correct? It's true in studies of both heterosexual and, and homosexual parents, that's right. And your study that you're launching is probably going to be extended in the future so that you can look at developmental trajectories as the children pass through other portions of their lifespan, correct? Uh, yes, it might be. But many of the studies you rely on are a single time snapshots and don't follow developmental tra trajectories, correct? Um, some of them are, yes. The study you were designing for the United Kingdom focuses on children who have been adopted at birth, correct? It will, yes. But many of the studies you look at, the children are the, the products of heterosexual unions, the children of the gay and lesbian couples, correct? Correct. And that's why you want to have different sorts of circumstances studied. And educational background, occupational choices, income available. These factors relate to aspects of parenting, so they are important ones to consider, correct? To consider, yes. And most of the studies listed in your materials address white, middle-class lesbians, correct? Um, I think many of them do, that's correct. Several of the studies listed in your materials considered don't have a control group against which the parenting skills of gays and lesbians can be measured, correct? Some of the studies don't have a comparison group of heterosexual parents, um, because for the purposes of those uh, studies, those weren't um, necessary. We know that the child outcomes are better on average for children raised by two parents rather than one, correct? On average, that's correct, yes. But Many of the studies you rely on in forming your opinions in this case compare the children of lesbians to single mothers, correct? Some of them co co compared to single mothers, some of them to two-parent families. And some of them show that the children of the lesbian couples are only doing as well as the children of the single mothers, correct? Some of them show that they are doing as well as the children of, of, of the lesbian. Sorry, that the children being raised by lesbians and singles are similar, that's right. We also know from the literature that the presence of a stepfather can increase the likelihood of negative childhood outcomes, correct? Yes, the entry of uh, any additional person to a child's uh, rearing environment can have an influence. Many of the studies you rely on are not a comparison between married biological parents as compared to gay or lesbian parents, correct? 
I would hope so. Um, what I tried to do is summarize a large body of research that studies uh, lots of different types of families. In terms of outcomes, many studies look at educational attainment as a measure of childhood well adjustment, correct? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, in particular with the level of things like uh, completion of schooling, um, adequate schooling. And many of the studies are of young children, so there is no meaningful track record of educational achievement, correct? Yeah. Um, a, uh, a variety of ages has to be studied. And some of the studies that do attempt to measure educational attainment look to grade point averages, correct? Some do, yes. But none of the studies try to compare the difficulty of the subject matters that children are taking or the difficulty of their schools, correct? I think that's correct, yes. If you wanted to measure whether a child had reached his or her intellectual potential, you would want to compare their native intelligence, perhaps measured by IQ, and compare that to their grade point average or some other metric uh, of educational attainment, correct? Well, that would be nice. Um, that tends not to be the case in most of the research that people do on educational attainment, uh, regardless of the gender orientation of the parents. Right. In fact, there's not one single one of the studies you rely on in this case which has tried to measure the educational attainment of these children as compared to their potential, correct? Probably correct. And there's fairly reliable association between family size and IQ, correct? Uh, it's not a very sizable correlation. Um, there is a reliable correlation. And having one sibling turns out to be quite positive, correct? It seems to have po uh, positive benefits. Uh, relatively small, but uh, reliable. But many of the studies listed in your expert report do not hold constant for the number of siblings, correct? They may not hold it constant, yes, that's correct. Some of them don't. And for those that look at educational attainment of children and they look at college, there are some that look at college matriculation, is that right? I think that's correct, yes. But they, th those studies, don't try to measure the caliber of the university. They treat a degree from your university the same as a degree from a community college, correct? Um, I think a, a degree from a community college is, is usually distinguished, but yes, uh, going to some further education is usually the marker. But they don't try to distinguish between, let's say, a four-year degree at Cambridge University and a four-year degree at a far less prestigious university, correct? That's correct. And it's important to be as precise as possible in making comparisons, correct? As a general rule, yes. Uh, Resources available to a child are an important variable in predicting childhood outcomes, correct? Yes, of course. Absolutely. But not one of your studies you have looked at considers the resources that grandparents make available to children, correct? I think that's not correct. Some of them look at the financial resources that grandparents make available? You said resources. You didn't say financial resources. Certainly there have been studies about the extent of involvement with grandparents' generations, that's correct. And that's because grandparents can be important to a child's psychological adjustment, correct? That's correct. But none of the studies you rely on take into account the financial resources that grandparents might make available to a child, correct? Can I just, um, when you talk about none of the studies, uh, we're talking about the thousands of studies of children's adjustments. We are talking about the hundred or so studies about same-sex parenting. Okay, I'm not sure that any of them have looked at financial transfers specifically. Well, you can't identify a single one, correct? Not as I sit here today, no. And none of the studies look at the educational attainment of grandparents either, correct? Well, many of them do as, a, as part of the process of describing the backgrounds or origins of those individuals. They look at the educational attainment of the grandparents? Or something that would be related to that, some measure of uh, social class background. Clearly, we know that the psychological well-being of parents affects their ability to parent and affects the quality of the relationships they have with their children, correct? I said so, yes. But when it comes to minority stress syndrome that Dr. Meyer testified to, you're not familiar with that literature, correct? No, I'm not an expert on that literature. You would agree that lots of researchers have shown that being a depressed parent changes the way you behave and interact with your child, and that can indirectly affect the child's adjustment as well, correct? Yes, that's correct. I would like you to turn to tab 41 in your binder, which is DIX 131. This is the affidavit of Stephen Nock that was submitted to the Superior Court of Justice in Ontario. 
is part of the Canadian same-sex marriage legal battle. Professor Nock was a professor of sociology at the University of uh, Virginia. Is that right? I understand so, yes. And he was a well-known family sociologist. Is that correct? I know he was a family sociologist. Well, let's look at what you said during your deposition, page 243. You said at line 11, answer. I know that he was a well-known family sociologist. Okay. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay, and he is unfortunately deceased at the present, correct? I believe so, yes. Uh, I think you told me so at the deposition. Yes, that's, that's right. I'd like to direct your attention to page 7 of this document, in particular to paragraph 20, and it says in the last sentence of that paragraph, if a valid and scientifically adequate study were to show that there is no correlation between having gay or lesbian parents and a child's well-being based on a comparison of representative groups of each type of parent and differing only on sexual orientation, then most scientists would accept that there is no casual link between the two. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm turning your attention to the next paragraph in particular, sorry, uh, paragraph 22 under sampling, where he says, first and foremost, the ability of any social science evidence to apply to a larger group depends on the way the sample of cases was obtained. Would you agree with that statement? N no, I wouldn't. Um, I would agree that it is related to understanding and specifying how you obtain your sample. In the second sentence, he says, a probability sample is one in which every member of a definable population has a known probability of being included in the study. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes. Um, that's what I was talking about when I called that uh, a representative sample. All right. And then turning to paragraph 23, he states in the first sentence, a probability sample is required whenever a researcher wishes to make claims about the larger population from which the sample was drawn. Do you agree with that statement? Well, it's a sociologist version. Uh, psychologists don't usually do studies that way. Okay. And if the goal is to make general claims about same-sex parental relationships and the children who might be affected by them, then we must have a probability sample drawn from the larger population of homosexual parents and children. Do you agree with respect Professor Knox's statement? Well, I would expand on his statement and say that we need uh, many studies using a variety of different sampling procedures and that's what I testified to this morning. Now, I would like you to turn uh, your attention to paragraph 29, and in particular to the last full sentence on page 10. It says, Professor Nock says, Moreover, <clears throat> we do not have an agreed upon definition of homosexuality. Is a homosexual a person whose erotic interests are focused on those of the same sex? Is a homosexual a person who sometimes engages in sexual acts with a member of the same sex? Is a homosexual a person who thinks of himself as a homosexual? Does a single sexual act with a person of the same sex define a person as a homosexual? Also important in the case is how to define bisexual. Are bisexuals to be treated as homosexuals, heterosexuals, or both? And how does one decide? Is homosexuality learned, i.e. socially constructed, or is it transmitted genetically? Finally, is male homosexuality, uh, uh, homosexuality the same phenomenon as female homosexuality? Answers to such questions have direct and important consequences for one how investigates the topics in this case. Would you agree that coming to a settled definition of homosexuality so that you can at least define the relevant population is important for social science looking into these sorts of issues? I think that neither uh, Steve Nock nor myself are experts on homosexuality. Certainly, in the literature that explores the effects of parenting, the issues are focused on self-definition of individuals as either same-sex orientated or opposite-sex orientated. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to the... Uh, well, let me ask you this. In order to determine that specific characteristics of the father-child relationship affect certain aspects of the child's personality, it is necessary to use those correlational strategies that permit causal 
inferences, such as cross-legged panel correlations to supplement experimental and quasi-experimental studies. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, yes, I think that's another statement of my belief, um, that you need to use multiple techniques and multiple approaches in order to understand the phenomenon. All right. Now, I would like to direct your attention to page 18 of the Knock Affidavit. Please let me know when you're there. Uh, yes, I'm there. In addition to identifying and obtaining a sample, a researcher must identify... Uh, can you tell me where this is? Well, let me just ask a question, and uh, we can see if we need to get into the details at the, at the moment. Would you agree that in addition to identifying and obtaining a sample, a, research, a researcher must determine how information is to be obtained from the sample? Is that right? Yes. All right. And when Professor Knox says it in the first sentence of paragraph 49, before gathering a single datum from a sample, one must first translate the concepts of interest into indicators that can be measured. Would you agree with that? Yes. And then he goes on to say, this is a central part of the entire process of designing the data gathering procedure. Would you agree? Yes. Sometimes the project calls for a, a questionnaire survey. Would you agree? Yes. Typically, in such cases, the concepts to be investigated are translated into specific questions on a questionnaire. Would you agree? If you were going to use a questionnaire, you would have to, uh, you would certainly have to write it. That's correct. And these are important parts of determining the reliability and validity of a study. Is that right? I'm not sure that that follows from what you said, but it is certainly important to establish the uh, reliability and validity of whatever measures used. That's, that's correct. <clears throat> Your Honor, at this point, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 131. Very well. And, Professor, I would like to direct your attention to tab 44. This is a document entitled, No Basis, What the Studies Don't Tell Us About Same-Sex Parenting, by Robert Lerner and Althea Nagaya. And you have... Uh, you have reviewed. Did you review this document in connection with your testimony in this case? Um, I have read this document in the past. I don't think I've read it in connection with this case, no. But you have read it in the past? Uh-huh. Okay. Your Honor, we would move the, uh, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of <clears throat> DIX 734. Well, I will do that if you ask him a question about it, since we are proceeding under 803 subset 18, I believe it is. Okay. And, uh, Professor, the conclusion that Dr. Lerner reached is that the same-sex parenting literature was not sufficiently reliable to draw conclusions one way or the other about the parenting skills and abilities of same-sex couples. Is that right? Uh, that was the conclusion he reached then. Um, and this is about a 10-year-old document, but that's correct. Yes, yes. Now, Your Honor, we would request the court to take uh, judicial notice. That'll be fine. Thank you, Your Honor. The number is DIX 734. Correct, DIX 734. Dr. Lamb, turning to the next tab in your binder, 45, this is an article by Walter Schum of Kansas State University. What was really learned from Tasker and Gollenbach's study of lesbian and single parent mothers? Have you reviewed this article ever? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I've seen this before. It's published in a journal where one has to pay to have articles published. So it's not usually considered part of the uh, scientific literature. Um, but since he was involved in previous cases, I saw it in that context. And you have squared off against Professor Schum in some other cases. Is that right? I have seen him there, yes. And he says, at the end of the document, he says, policymakers should interpret research on gays and family life or on any very small subset of any population with extreme caution. And would you agree at least that when you are talking about a very small subset of any population, a researcher should proceed with caution? Could you uh, repeat the question? Yes. Would you? See, I, I, I think researchers should always proceed with caution and make sure that there uh, was adequate basis for whatever conclusions they draw. Your Honor, we would request that the court take judicial notice of DIX 779. Very well. Then turning to the next tab in your binder 46, this is Families with Young Children, a review of research in the 1990s. 
And you have reviewed this document in connection with the case? No, I have not. All right. I'd like to ask you to turn to page 889. Let me know when you are there. I'm there. And looking at the right-hand column, the last paragraph, second sentence says, one, relatively new line of inquiry is the development and adjustment of children living in families headed by lesbian, gay, or bisexual parents. And then if we skip down. Let's see. Where are you reading from? Uh, yes, Your Honor. It's the. Um, eight, eight, nine. It's the last paragraph on the page, the second sentence. Thank you. Certainly. And then turning to the, uh, skipping down to the last, excuse me, the, the second to the last sentence on the page, it says, a persistent limitation of these studies, however, is that most rely on small samples of white, middle class, previously married lesbians and their children. And at least at the time this was written, that was a true statement, wasn't it? I think that that's a true statement as a description of the majority of studies at the time. That's true. They conclude, as a result, we cannot be confident concerning the generalizability of many of the findings. And that's a fair point, isn't it? Well, it continues to talk about the, uh, a more broad question there. Let me just ask it as a concern. Based on the concern, the persistent limitation they have just identified, would you agree that we cannot be confident concerning the generalizability of many of the findings? If you're, you would have to be careful about that if you're, uh, if you're relying on a relatively small body of research that involved only a small group of individuals. Homogenous, uh, sorry, a, a more homogenous set of individuals. And, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 749. Very well. Turning to tab 47 in your binder, Dr. Lamb. This is an article, Does the Sexual Orientation of Parents Matter? And it's by Judith Stacy of the University of Southern California and a colleague of hers. And uh, are you familiar with Professor Stacy's work at all? Uh, yes. And she is an advocate for the rights of gays and lesbians, correct? Uh, I don't know about that, but... Um... All right. Well, let's turn to page 168 of this document, and in particular, footnote 9. And she has just, uh, in the text, she has just talked about that there are studies showing greater gender conformity. Well, I will read the sentence to which footnote 9 is appended. However, on other measures such as occupational goals, sartorial styles, they, and this means, I believe, the, the children of lesbians also exhibit greater gender conformity. Um, I'm sorry. Let's see. I do not find that paragraph. Am I missing something? Uh, Your Honor, let me, let me try this again. Uh, page 168. It is the last paragraph on the page, and I, uh, the, the point I want to focus on is footnote 9. You were reading and, from the text. Well, I, I was reading from the, the text just to try to give the context, and I, I think I didn't back up far enough. All right. Dr. Lamb. Why don't you read the text to which footnote 9 is appended, and then I will ask you a question about footnote 9. Sons appear to respond in more complex ways to parental sexual orientations. On some measures, like aggressiveness and play preferences, the sons of lesbian mothers behave in a less traditionally masculine way than those raised by heterosexual single mothers. However, in other measures, such as occupational goals, uh, sartorial styles, they also exhibit greater gender conformity than do daughters with lesbian mothers. But they are not more conforming than sons with heterosexual mothers. There is a citation or two to two studies, um, one by Richard Green and the other by Anne Steckel. And then in the footnote it says, Many of these studies use conventional levels of significance on minuscule samples, substantially increasing their likelihood of failing to reject the null hypothesis. Is Professor Stacy right that if you use a minuscule sample, you substantially increase the likelihood of failing to reject the null hypothesis? Uh, yes. And she concludes this footnote by saying, 
For very small samples, conventional levels of statistical significance, she is referring to, can actually be too restrictive. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PAX uh, 1394. Very well. Turning to tab 48 in your binder, Dr. Lamb. This is DIX 782. It's entitled Science and Advocacy Issues and Research on Children of Gay and Lesbian Parents. And it's written by Virginia Schiller of Yale University. She writes in the very last sentence on the page, the first page. Given that opponents make egregious statements about the unfitness of gay and lesbian parents and the pathology of their children, we are justified in lowering our standards about how scientific research is described and reported. And would you agree that the, the proposition that scientific standards have been lowered in this area precisely because of the need to combat prior bias in the medical community against gays and lesbians? I don't know. Um anything about the medical community, but I don't think it's true of the research that I'm familiar with. You don't think that there was a bias previously in the psychological community against gays and lesbians? I understood you to be asking me to comment on a specific... Well, well, maybe you want to ask the question again. That's all right. We can, we can move on. I would like to turn your attention to the next tab, which is 49. This is a document entitled Children in Three Contexts, Family, Education, and social development. And this is a document that concludes that the children of gays and lesbians do less well, have worse outcomes than the children of heterosexuals. Is that correct? Uh, it is, yes. But you ignored this study in your opening report in this case, correct? It wasn't something you even considered, was it? Oh, well, I, I didn't list it. Um, as I think I pointed out in my report, I tried to consider thousands of contributions to the literature. I, I certainly didn't list all of the things that I was taking into account. This study is a, a complete outlier from the rest of the research, and by the author's own admission, it contains problems in the design and interpretation that make it very hard to justify the conclusions that the author reaches. It has a, a larger sample size than any of the gay parenting literature that you cite. Isn't that right? Absolutely not. Which of your articles and your materials considered has a larger sample size than uh, with respect to that compares the childhood outcomes of the children of gays and lesbians as compared to heterosexuals? Well, the largest sample, of course, is the Rosenfeld one, which is the national sample. And that was not in my initial report because I wasn't aware of it at the time. Um, this one doesn't um, include a total... Um, includes a total of 58 children being raised by lesbians and gay parents. Yes, and then it has a control group, correct? And it has two comparison groups, in fact, uh, one of married heterosexuals and one of cohabiting heterosexuals. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 775. Very well. All right, turning to tab 50. This is entitled Parenting and Planned Lesbian Families. And this was one of the studies you considered informing your opinions in this case. Is that right? That's right. If we look to page 68, I would ask you to look at it. Um, I notice this is incomplete. Is that intentional? Yes. Turning to tab 65, this is PX1427. And it doesn't, you considered this document in connection with your opinions in this case, right, Dr. Lamb? Uh, that's correct. And it does not have, as a control group, married biological parents, correct? As far as I can tell, uh, this is a literature review rather than a study, but maybe it does. It, it focuses on the results of one of the studies um, that I think we've already talked about. Um, and again, it's probably the case that they did not exclude from the heterosexual group who were not married. All right, and turning to tab 66, this is another one of the studies that you relied upon in this case, correct? Yes. Oh, and I believe my, my haste, I forgot to ask the court, Your Honor, please, to take judicial notice of PX1427. Very well. Turning to tab 66, Dr. Lamb, this is PX1079, and this is a document you considered, correct? Uh, that's correct. And it doesn't have, as a control group, married biological parents, correct? That's correct. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1079. Very well. Turning to tab 67, this is another study that you relied upon in this case. Is that right, Dr. Lamb? 
That is correct. And it doesn't have as a control group married biological parents, correct? Again, they did not exclude people who are not married. I think that most of all of the people in the comparison group were married. Your Honor, this is PX1125, and we would request that judicial notice be taken of it. If that same question applies to all of these, perhaps you can summarize them in some fashion. Well, the only point, Your Honor, is that Dr. Lamb likes to talk about this rich, deep literature, and we want to show <laughs> that he doesn't have any studies that are married biological parents, which is our core position in this case. And that's, that's the optimum environment for raising counsel, children. Counsel, counsel, counsel. I apologize. Counsel, we are trying a case. Yes. Is there a way to shorten the presentation to the point that you are trying to make with all these documents by putting them all together? One question with respect to a whole group? Well, maybe we could just, I could get him to confirm that each one of these he looked at and then ask him one question at the end and get them all in. Would, would that be all right? Same question with respect to all? Yes, yes. Maybe that would be helpful? Yes, yes, oh, okay. And, and maybe one or two variants in, in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, that's a, that's a very good suggestion. So, Professor Lamb, PX1133 is a document you considered, is that right? Sorry, PX1131 behind tab 68. Yes. All right. And Your Honor, may I ask that uh, judicial notice be taken along the way? Why don't you ask that at the end? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll make a list. And PX1083 was a document relied on in connection with the witness's testimony? With the witness's testimony. Is that right, Dr. Lamb? It's behind tab 69. Uh, so turning to page 68, it concludes under differences and parental behavior, the last sentence on that page. These differences indicate that lesbian biological mothers scored lower on structure and limit setting than did the heterosexual mothers. And would you uh, agree that setting limits is an important parenting skill, correct? I agree, yes. Perhaps, Perhaps this is not the only area in which setting limits would be helpful. I appreciate that, Your Honor. It's uh, unfortunately in extensive literature, as the uh, doctor says. Turning to tab 51, this is another one of the studies you relied on, is that correct? I think this is the report drawn from the one uh, that we just talked about. Okay. And it does not explicitly say that it's comparing the childhood outcomes of same-sex couples with married biological parents, correct? Um, no, this one does not, know. And let's, uh, but, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1055. Very well. Then. Turning to tab 52 in your binder, this is PX1075, and this is another document that you relied upon. Is that right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. And this one looked at only younger children. Is that correct? At this point, yes. And again, this study did not compare childhood outcomes of the children of same-sex couples with the children of married biological parents, correct? I, I think that's correct, yes. Well, let's turn to, uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1075. Why don't you ask him a question about the exhibit that is the precondition for condition notice under 803 subset 18? Yes, Your Honor. Well, this study, I, I, I guess the question, Your Honor, I had, I, I'm trying to ask is that it doesn't compare with these... To try to speed things up, my, my main question to him is going to be that these studies don't actually compare the children of married biological parents to same-sex couples. And so that's, that's really the question. I'm getting him to prove a, a negative in Ask the sense of... the witness. I, I apologize, Your Honor. Okay, so, Dr. Lamb, just to be clear, the comparison group here is not of married biological parents. There's nothing in this study you can point to that would establish that comparison group, correct? I'm sure that neither uh, you nor the judge wants me to read uh, through it to check. Um, my understanding is that they didn't exclude people depending on uh, whether or not they were married. Okay. 
and uh, I would... All right. Well, thank you. Judicial notice taken, 1075. You may move on. Okay. Tab 53, PX1115. Again, <clears throat> this one did not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Uh, it had a comparison group of heterosexual parents. Um, my understanding was uh, they didn't... Uh, exclude people who are not married in the heterosexual group. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of 1115. Very well. Turning to tab 54, Dr. Lamb, this is one of the studies you relied on in this case, is that right? PX 1072. Uh, yes. Okay, and it do did not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Uh, well, it had a comparison group of heterosexuals again. Um, I, I don't know. I, as I'm trying to respond to you uh, quickly here, whether they excluded people in the heterosexual group who are not married. So you just don't know how many of these studies compared married biological, the, the children of married biological parents to the children of same-sex couples. Uh, it, it would. Comparing people uh, being raised by their heterosexual parents with individuals being raised by lesbian couples um, that was the focus of these studies, as I recall. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1072. Very well. Turning to tab 55, Dr. Lamb, this is PX1049, and this is another study that you considered informing your opinions in this case, correct? Uh, this is, sorry, uh, which one? Uh, this is under tab 55, the, the adoption study. This one, yeah? Yes, and it, it, too, does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Again, I believe that it compared, I mean, it did not exclude people who are not married from the heterosexual group. Okay. To the best of my recollection. And turning, uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1049. Very well. Turning to tab 56, Dr. Lamb, this is PX1088. This is a document you considered in connection with this case, correct? Correct. And it, too, does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? I believe that's correct, um, that they did not exclude people who were not married. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1088. Very well. Turning to tab 57, Dr. Lamb, this is PX1066. This is another document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? Uh, that's right. And it does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Well, like the others, it did not exclude people in the heterosexual group who were not married. All right. And I would like to direct your attention to page 27 of this document, the second column. And tell me when you're there. Page 27, second column? Yeah, I'm there. Okay. So... It says in the first sentence of the second column, <clears throat> five of the 38 rated children in lesbian mother families, 13% were classified as showing psychiatric disorder, one with conduct disorder, one with conduct and emotional disorder, two with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and one with developmental disorder, compared with 12 of the 134 children in heterosexual families, 9%. So this is a study that you relied on that on this metric of psych psychiatric disorder shows that children of gays and lesbians at almost a 50% greater risk. Is that right? No. Um, actually, if you read the preceding sentence, it says there were no differences between the children in those two groups. Um, that difference that you just referred to uh, is not statistically significant. No, 50% isn't statistically significant because it's such a tiny sample size. Is, no. Is that it? Uh, no, it's not statistically significant. Because it's a small sample size, right? Because the difference isn't large enough to be statistically significant. Sample size is one of the factors that determines statistical significance. Uh, the second is the magnitude of the difference. Right, and here it was 50%, but that's not enough because the sample is so small, right? Uh, it's not statistically significant. Uh, that's... It's not a difference. <laughs> it's not a statistically significant difference. That's correct. Yes. Therefore, it's not reliable. It's not a difference in terms of the literature. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1066. Very well. 
Turning to tab 58 in your binder, this is a PX1061. It's a document you relied upon in reaching your conclusions in this case. Is that right? That's right. And it doesn't compare the outcomes of married biological parents to the outcomes of the children of same-sex couples, correct? Again, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they did not exclude people who are not married from the heterosexual comparison group. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1061. Very well. Turning to tab 59, this is PX1073. It's a document that you considered in reaching your conclusions in this case. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. And it did not control for married biological parents, correct? It did not exclude unmarried biological parents from the heterosexual group. That is, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial Wait notice. Wait a minute. I think the witness was asking for a clarification of the question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, what was the question? My question is, is the control group married biological parents their children? And, and I understand you to say that no, it's not, because it was all heterosexuals and unmarried hadn't been excluded. Well, to the best of my knowledge, and, and you're not, I, I don't have time to read through them, uh, I think that's correct. So, yes. So in, so in all of these cases, certainly from the early eras, the, the, the majority of them would have been married. But uh, the unmarried ones were, insofar as I recall, not excluded from those. Very well. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1073. Very well. Turning to tab 60, this is PX1160, and this is a document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? That's right. And it does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Uh, it, again, did not exclude people who are not married so far as I recall. All right. And I'd like to turn your attention to the, uh, well, it's, it's, it's page 787, which appears in small font in the upper right-hand corner of these pages. It's, uh, it's about the fifth page of the exhibit. Okay. Sorry, sixth page of the exhibit. And you see the chart that says, Table 2, Group Comparisons on Measures of Children's Emotions, Behavior, and Relationships. Uh-huh. And... I do. In the fourth row down, it says uh, cognitive competence. Can you see that? On the second table, yes. Yes. And can you help us out what the vertical column that means X, what does that stand for? So there is, a, there is an N and an X and an SE. And is the N in the number of people in the sample? Uh, yes, the N should be the number of people, the X should be the main score, and the SE would be the standard error of the, of the measure. And so we see for the heterosexual two parents, the cognitive competence of their children was higher than the cognitive competence of the children of the single heterosexual mothers. Is that right? Um, that appears to be true in the sample, yes. And that the, it's also higher than the children of the lesbian mother families, correct? Um, well, you have got the comparisons at the end, um, and one of those differences seems not to be significant, and the other is. And the one for the lesbian families is statistically significant, correct? Well, that's what I'm trying to understand, what the... Well, it's, uh, it's the, certainly a worse outcome, isn't it? In this case, it seems to be, yes. All right, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1160. 116050. Zero, zero, zero. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Turning to tab 61, this is PX1065, and in this a document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? Uh, that's right. And in this document does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Uh, it's a follow up to one of the other studies you already, um, uh, groups you already asked me about. So, I think the answer is the same here. All right. Very well. Your Honor, we ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1065. Very well. Turning to tab 62, this is PX1081, and this is a study that you relied upon, correct? Um, sorry, i got to catch up. Uh, 10, 1081? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. 
and it does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Uh, that's correct. All right, and Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1081. Very well. Turning to tab 63, this is another study that you relied on in the connection with this case. It's PX1092, is that correct? Uh, yes. And it does not have a control group, married biological parents, correct? I think that's correct. Again, the same point I made earlier, yes, I, I do think that's correct. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1092. Very well. Turning to tab 64, this is PX1428. And this is one of the studies you relied upon in this case, is that right? I'm certainly familiar with it. I don't remember as, as I sit here whether I list, listed it, but, uh, but yes. All right. And it doesn't have, as a control group, married biological parents, correct? Uh, that may be correct. Yes. I, again, that's correct. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1428, something you considered in connection with the case. I'm familiar with these studies, yes. And let's go to tab 70, which is PX1116. Uh-huh. You considered this in connection with this case, is that right? Yes. Let's go to tab 71, which is PX778, and it does not have a, you considered this document, correct? Yes. And let's go to tab 72. It's PX1111, and you considered this document in this case, correct? Yes. And let's go to tab 113. It's PX1049, and you relied upon this document in this case, correct? Yes. And let's go to tab 74, and, well, I think that these next tabs we can actually probably just skip. So let me ask you, Dr. Lamb, with respect to all the studies we just looked at, isn't it true that none of them had as a control group married biological parents? I think most of them had as a control group married biological parents, but for, for the most part, but, but they, so, so far as I remember, not having a chance to review these papers that they did not exclude people on the grounds that they were not married. Right. So if you don't exclude someone who is not married, that means the control group could have unmarried people in it. That's what I'm saying, yes. Okay. Your Honor, we'll skip many of these tabs. With the court's permission, we have one last binder, which will not take long. I think uh, with this new procedure, we have in place to work through uh, it uh, expeditiously. May we pass that out? Yes. Um, can I put this one away, counsel? Yes, sir. Now, we've been looking at a lot of individual studies, but you also relied on some so-called meta-analysis. Is that right? Um, I think that there was only one meta-analysis, um, but maybe there were more than that. Um, there have been several meta-analyses, especially in the research on, uh, of adopted children. And can you explain what a meta-analysis is? Um, yeah, a meta-analysis is a procedure to combine the results of multiple studies uh, in order to assess the reliability of findings. Um, recognizing the fact that uh, from one study to another, you often have minor variations in results. Uh, you will sometimes have a result in one study that is uh, not repeated in others. Um, and it's important to get a sense of the whole uh, rather than to overemphasize those uh, local variations. All right. And tab 83, which is the first tab in this binder, is PX1090. Do you see that, sir? Yes. And this is a document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? Uh, probably. I don't specifically remember this one, but... I, I probably did. It was listed in your materials considered. I will represent it to you. And isn't it true that this meta-analysis, none of the studies that it surveys, have married biological parents as the control group? And we have attached all of them to this, all that we haven't already looked at. We have looked at most. Since these are summaries and surveys, we have looked at most of the literature already. But any that we haven't already covered, we attach to this. And isn't the point that there isn't a single study referenced in this survey that has as its control group married biological parents. I'm a little confused. Um, and maybe I've got the wrong binder. But I, I don't have a meta-analysis as the paper that you're uh, talking about. This is a short literature review. It's not a meta-analysis. So um, 
Are we talking about the same piece? Uh, okay, but it's a literature review. Okay. And that's what I meant. So maybe, maybe we will just say review rather than meta-analysis. This review, none of the studies that it reviews have married biological parents as the control group. Isn't that right? Again, I don't know. Um, I don't want to attest to that affirmatively. Um, it is my understanding that the researchers listed uh, in this reference list <laughs> Uh, probably did not exclude from the comparison group people who were not married. All right. Let's look at the next tab, which is tab 84, and this is another summary. Is that right? It's another review, as it says at the top, yes. Yes, and none of the articles that are reviewed in this document had married biological parents as the control group, correct? Uh, that's probably true, um, with the same qualifications just as, uh, as I just gave you. All right. And just so the record is clear, we're talking about PX1091 and then turning to tab 85. This is PX1123. This is another material you considered in connection with the case, correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, this is another literature review. Right. And none of the studies in this review had married biological parents as the control group, correct? That's probably correct. All right. Let's turn to, and so the record is complete. That was PX1123. Let's turn to tab 86. That's PX1089. This is another document you considered in connection with this case, is that right? Uh, it's another literature review, yes. And then there's not one of the studies that was reviewed in this survey that had a control group that was married biological parents, correct? Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, there are two under this tab. Let's see. Um, you've, got, you, you, you've got other things attached. But what we did was mo most of the things that are surveyed, We've already talked about, but there were a couple that weren't. So we're not trying to give you a, a memory test, but we just want to make sure the record is complete, that none of the articles surveyed in this piece had married biological parents as the control group, correct? Uh, again, as I, I suspected that they did not exclude people on that basis. Okay. Turning to tab 87, which is PX1064, they did not exclude unmarried people from their control group, correct? Uh, that's probably true. I mean, again, I, I, I don't know. You, you're asking me in a very rapid frame to talk about a large number of studies. Uh, I would expect, I would su suspect that most of these individuals uh, didn't exclude, most of these individuals didn't exclude individuals for that reason. Let's turn to tab 89, which is PX1384. This is another literature review you relied upon? Yeah. It, too, did not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Well, this is a very long um, literature review, which also includes some studies by Kurdek, who certainly did, and, and some of the titles are uh, here uh, specifically referred to, heterosexual, married, and not. So in this case, I feel comfortable saying that what you said is not true. Well, and this is Kurdek, though, isn't he studying the parents? Uh, he's studying couples, but that's... He's studying the couples, but he is not looking at childhood outcomes, is he? Uh, that's correct. Uh, this is a review article about family relationships you just gave me. Right. I just want the record to be clear that you are not identifying a study that measures childhood outcomes of same-sex couples as opposed to married biological in connection with this document, correct? Uh, yes, that's right. All right. And let's turn to tab 90. This is Parenting and Child Development, PX810. Is that correct? Uh, well, I, sorry, 89 we're on? No, 90, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, and the literature that reviewed in this document doesn't have married biological parents as the <clears throat> control group, correct? Again, yes, I, I was re reviewing most of the same studies, and as I said before, I suspect that most people did not Exclude individuals for that reason. All right. And turning to tab 91, PX1093, again, none of the articles that are surveyed in this survey had married biological parents as the control group, correct? I think that's correct. And turning to tab 92, PX1130, same answer. None of the materials or articles surveyed in this document you considered had married biological as a control group? Uh, I'm sorry. Are we talking about the Kodak article? This is about gay and lesbian couples. It's not about parents at all. Okay. Well, I just want to make clear that this is not, you're, you're not relying on this article for your same sex, for, for, for the motion that the childhood outcomes of gays and lesbians, their children, would be the same as for married biological parents, correct? 
Well, well, this is a review, a, a very short review of the literature on the uh, dynamics of relationships between gays and lesbians and heterosexuals and different sorts of family structures. The relevance of this uh, is that it shows uh, that the dynamics of those different families are very similar, regardless of, of whether the individuals are the same sex or heterosexual. Uh, but none of the studies that are reviewed here are themselves studies that focus on uh, adjustment of children. I, I think that's the case, yes? You are not aware of any study that looks at the specific benefits flowing to children whose parents are together under domestic partnership law in California, correct? I'm not aware of any study of that. And we don't have any studies that look at the behavioral outcomes for children with married same-sex parents, correct? That's correct. On an aggregate, the children being raised by gays and lesbians are comparable in their outcomes to those being raised by heterosexual parents, correct? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? On aggregate, the children being raised by gays and lesbians are comparable in their outcomes to those being raised by heterosexual parents, correct? Uh, that's correct. And that's true even though none of those gay and lesbian couples were married, correct? That's correct. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Very well. <clears throat> Mr. Miguel, redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Lamb, do you need a break? Are you all right? Um, well, I see the end in sight. I am <laughs> looking at the door. Yes, it is. Uh, Let's warm up our time machine and um, go way back in time before that cross-examination began and all the way back to 1975 when you held the view that the presence of a father itself could be a determinative factor in adjustment outcomes. Now, was that a fair characterization of your views as you held them in 1965 or 75? Um, well, I think that the issue had to do with the uh, specific characteristics of the father and whether it was... Um, there was something specifically important about the maleness of the parent that was important. Um, I still think that fathers are important figures in, child, in children's development and that when children do have a father figure, um, that those relationships are very uh, significant ones. Uh, and why is it that your views between uh, from before I was born until now... <laughs> this is your witness, Mr. Yes. McGill. Yes. Um, ...have changed? Uh, what has changed your views in the intervening 35 years? Uh, well, the body of evidence has been what's changed it. Um, the original view, as I said, was a hypothesis that came from, um, largely from theory at the time. And since then, we've had hundreds, thousands of articles that have explored the implications of that belief and, uh, and found it to be wanting. Now... When the literature in your field speaks of fatherless families or fatherless ab or father absence, what family structures is the literature describing when it uses those terms? Uh, well, overwhelmingly, the term used to describe heterosexual families in which uh, single heterosexual women are raising their children, either by choice or as a result of family dissolution. In, in your experience in the field, does the when, the, when a study identifies a group of fatherless families, does that group ever include families headed by lesbian mothers? Um, that term has been used uh, in some of the studies in the field, yes. And how frequently? There are a small number of studies that use that term, um, particularly uh, because some of them were designed to explore this issue about the, 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 the importance of having a male present in the lives of those children. Um, and so as to underscore that, uh, Blenkinhorn's book a, uh, c confused the issues of correlation and causality. Um, and, and I really think uh, misrepresented the state of knowledge at that point regarding the ways in which children's adjustment might be affected by their experiences. And we went through some of the reasons for that uh, earlier on today. I would uh, now like to publish a demonstrative, a demonstrative of page 527 of that, uh, of that book review. Would you read it, Dr. Lamb? Um, 
Uh, Blankenhorn's tendency to paint alternative visions in absurd or ridiculous terms in order to facilitate his dismissal of them le leads him in at least one important case to undercut his own thesis. And would you characterize that as a favorable review of any book? No. All right. Uh, Your Honor, we have marked Dr. Lamb's, uh, the totality of Dr. Lamb's review of, as Plaintiff's Exhibit 2548, and we ask that it would be admitted into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. 258 is admitted. All right. Do you recall among the documents you reviewed, Mr. Lamb, or Dr. Lamb, the Sarantacus... I think I misspoke. It's 2548, isn't it? Yes, Your Honor. It's uh, Exhibit 2548. That is Dr. Lamb's book review of Fatherless America. I beg your pardon. Sorry for the interruption. Not at all. Uh, Dr. Lamb, do you remember your brief review of the Sarantokas study with Dr. Thompson? Uh, yes, I do. And that appeared at tab uh, 49, 49, I believe, um, which would, would now be binder three. Okay, do I need to get that out? Uh, no, no, you needn't bring it out. I just wanted to ask if you if ask you if there was anything else you wanted to say about the Sarantaka study. Um, well, the key thing about the Sarantaka study um, are actually some problems that uh, Sarantaka himself acknowledges in the report, uh, and most importantly, is the fact that while it's uh, it's a study that ostensibly compares the adjustment of children being raised by two parents married. Um, two heterosexual parents married, two heterosexual parents cohabiting, and gay and lesbian families. The groups are clearly not uh, uh, comparable in very important ways. Um, notably, the fact that the children in the cohabiting and the same-sex parent groups had frequently experienced the separation and, uh, and uh, divorce of their parents, and in many cases, long before the data about them were gathered. And as we have talked about today, there is a, uh, a substantial body of evidence showing that the experience of the parents' divorce, um, the conflict around that, and, the, and as Sarantakos uh, noted himself, the fact that many of these children frequently moved home are all factors that would have affected their adjustment um, as well, and, and that would have uh, clearly been needed to be taken into account uh, in trying to interpret these results. In, in many ways, this is more illustrative of the um, effects of divorce than it is a study that really illustrates much about the effects of same-sex parenting. Um, the second problem, again, as Sarantakos does acknowledge later in his article, is the fact that all of the data were gathered um, by interviewing the teachers. And he recognizes this as a particular problem in this case because many of the teachers acknowledged having uh, homophobic attitudes. And in fact, um, the fact that, uh, that, that, that may have biased their reports is clearly something that would, 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 would be needed to be taken into account. And finally, uh, they used very different ways of selecting the samples for this study which again compromises the ability to see that in the body of literature. And so while the results themselves are out of step with the results of the rest of the research, understanding these deficiencies uh, of the study makes it clearer to understand exactly uh, why those results are so out of step with the rest of the literature. And have the findings of the Sarantaga study ever been corroborated or duplicated in any other study? Uh, they have not. And are you of aware of any other study that finds children who are parented by gays or lesbians to be less well-adjusted than children who are parented by heterosexual parents? Uh, no, there's no other study that finds that as the major report. Um, there are a couple of studies that we talked about over, over the course of the day uh, in which there would be one measure showing uh, a, a difference one way or another. Um, and clearly, you would expect to find those kinds of local variations when you're talking about a large body of literature. Um, but there's no other study that shows, uh, in this way, uh, major problems on the part of children being raised by uh, gay and lesbian parents. Do you recall where the Sarantoga study was published? Um, it was published in an Australian magazine called uh, Children Australia. 
Is that a peer-reviewed journal, to your knowledge? I don't think so, but I don't know. Does it appear in any of the electronic databases that are used in your field? No, it does not. Has it ever been relied upon uh, by one of your colleagues or someone else who's viewed as an authority in the field of developmental psychology? I think most people in the field of studying children's adjustments have the, uh, the same concerns about this study as I do. Now, why do the hundred or so studies on which you rely provide a reliable basis for your opinion in this case? Well, I think that they provide a reliable basis because uh, firstly, they provide a very consistent account of the healthy adjustment of most children being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Uh, but secondly, I think what makes that literature persuasive uh, is the fact that the patterns of results are very similar to the patterns of results that have been obtained in uh, the wider body of, of research on factors that affect children's adjustment. Uh, uh, for example, um, children whose lesbian parents have a, uh, a conflictual relationship are less well adjusted than children with lesbian parents who have a more harmonious relationship, um, just as you find in the literature on heterosexual families. So with respect to all of the broad factors that we've spoken about, um, the first thing this f that we spoke about first thing this morning, we see that it's the same factors that predict the adjustment of children in gay and lesbian families as they do when children have heterosexual parents. And that, as I said before, the evidence makes clear that having a gay or lesbian parent does not make children more likely to be maladjusted than if those children were raised by heterosexual parents. You testified that there were fewer studies of gay parents than lesbian parents and the adjustment of their respective children. Is that true? Uh, that's correct, yes. Now, why, in the absence of an equal number of studies of gay male parents and the adjustment of their children, <clears throat> are you comfortable opining that their children are less likely, are no less likely, to be well adjusted than children of heterosexual parents? Well, I think that I feel comfortable doing that because one has to look at the totality of the evidence base and start off from the fact that we have a good understanding of what it is that affects the adjustment of children. And in the context of understanding that, it's also very clear from lots of research that the gender and sexual orientation of the parent is not one of those factors that's important. Secondly, we have the evidence that shows that it is the same factors that affect children's adjustment regardless of the sexual orientation of their parents. Third, we do have a growing number, uh, a much smaller number, but a growing number of studies that look directly at the adjustment of children being raised by gay parents. And the combination of these different bodies of, it, of literature, I think, makes me confident that the outcomes for children raised by uh, gay fathers are the same as those for children raised by lesbian mothers and the same as those for children being raised by heterosexual parents, taking into account all of the factors that we've already spoken about. At the start of Mr. Thompson's cross-examination, you confessed membership in the ACLU, the NAACP, the Nature Conservancy, Amnesty International, and Mr. Thompson even identified you as a supporter of public broadcasting. Now, did the Corporation for Public Broadcasting influence your opinion in this case? <laughs> no, it did not. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. Very well, Dr. Lamb. Thank you for your testimony, sir. You may step down. And we call the next witness.